Hi, my name is Wendy L. Sasser, and I work in the ARM Research Group, and in this video I want to discuss memory controller changes that were made within GEM5, specifically looking at how the memory controller was refactored and the addition of an initial NVM interface. I also want to note that in the workshop, uh, the slot that will cover this video is also going to cover a second video that has been submitted that is looking at new controller features for DRAM technologies, specifically looking at what was done for LPDDR5. In this video, I'm first going to give a quick review of the GEM5 memory subsystem, look at what it means to refactor the DRAM controller and why we would even want to do that, provide an overview of non-volatile memory, and then take a look at the initial NVM interface. And then we'll close with next steps. Before we get into the details, I do want to note that the changes that will be discussed in this presentation are currently under review. Within GEM5, the DRAM controller is used to interface to external user addressable memory, and this object contains two main components which are shown here in the picture. You have the host memory controller, which interfaces to the system on chip fabric, contains read or write cues, and a command scheduler. And then there's the DRAM technology component, which is very media specific. It's based off of the DRAM architecture and contains timing requirements as well as potentially IDD values for PAL analysis. But there is a logical break that exists between the host and media operations. And as we start to look and look towards the future where we want to support different media types and potentially different types of protocols, it makes sense to break these pieces apart. If we want to separate, separate out the DRAM interface, this is conceptually what it would look like. So we have the DRAM controller still containing the parameters used to define the controller functionality, but we also create a new object within Python that defines the DRAM interface and we move all of the DRAM specific parameters to this interface. So it contains everything that relates to the DRAM architecture as well as all of the timing parameters. I'm not gonna iterate through all these parameters, but essentially they're the parameters that define the DRAM timing requirements as well as the IDD values that define the currents used for power analysis. So to refactor the DRAM controller, we created new objects or new memory, new classes within the C code and moved the functions and parameters around. So if we look at where we started, we had a DRAM controller, which was defined as an abstract memory. We had different subclasses. I've shown the main ones here, where we have a memory port that interfaces to the on-chip fabric, the rank, which includes most of the DRAM specific functionality. And then we have other classes, DRAM packet and bank, which are used for multiple functions within the DRAM controller that span controller as well as DRAM specific uh, capabilities. Refactoring that, we pulled the DRAM packet and DRAM bank out of the controller. Then we also pulled DRAM specific information out of the controller and created a new class called that DRAM interface, instantiated the rank class beneath the interface and made it an abstract memory. So now we're able to define a range per interface. That range will be associated with the controller, but the controller is now defined as a clocked object. And in the next page, we'll go over how everything is connected together and how that controller interfaces with the DRAM interface. So starting with our memory configuration, I've shown here a DDR4 2400 4x16. That is now defined as a DRAM interface. So it is inherits a DRAM interface class. Previously, it would inherit the DRAM controller class. Um, we assign it an address range. We then create a memory controller, a DRAM controller. The DRAM controller includes now, we've added a new parameter within the Python object, which is a pointer to the actual DRAM interface. So we connect that up to the interface that we have configured. We also connect up the memory port, which will interface to the on-chip fabric. Then we iterate over the number of controllers. Um, of course, we would also apply our interleaving mask as we're doing this, so we can interleave using the memory range that we've assigned. Iterate over the number of ranges that have been assigned as well. And in the end, we're creating an array of memory controllers. Each memory controller has a parameter that 
points to the DRAM interface for which it is connected. When we run the, um, <clears throat> the model, what happens is first in the DRAM controller, we will call a function. The function is a function that is defined in the DRAM interface that essentially sets up a pointer from the DRAM back to the controller so that the interface can also understand the controller for which it is attached to. Within the DRAM interface, we initialize, and so we initialize it as an abstract memory. We instantiate all the ranks that were defined, and then we take the range that is or has been assigned to the DRAM interface and push it back to the memory port so that the interface to the on-chip fabric understands the range that is associated with this interface that is connected to the controller. Now that we've refactored the DRAM controller into a controller plus a separate object for the actual memory interface, specifically the DRAM interface, I want to expand on that and look at what an initial NVM interface would look like within GEM5. Before I get into the interface, a quick overview of emerging non-volatile memory. Um, if you're using the non-volatile memory as main memory, you potentially are adding persistence to user addressable memory, though that is not something that is always required. It's application specific. It's typically not as performant as DRAM, and there are a lot of topologies that are possible, and multiple attachment points. You could attach it to the DRAM bus, or potentially attach it to uh, a packetized protocol such as CXL. The timing determinism is not the same as DRAM. So DRAM is a very deterministic memory. Not all non-volatile memories are that deterministic. Uh, NAND, if you look at the other extreme, has a very long tail latency. And these emerging technologies fall somewhere in between. And there's no universal memory. There's no silver bullet, no one size fits all. They all have different characteristics and different trade-offs that have to be made looking at performance, power, and capacity. Within GEM5, what we did for the NVM interface was create a more agnostic interface compared to what we have with DRAM. And this allows us to support different latencies across technologies or within the technology without needing to understand the details of the technology itself. Looking at the cartoon that we've drawn here, if you think back to how the DRAM interface works, we have a command request bus and we have a bidirectional data bus. For the NVM, we've also conceptually added a command response bus, and that response will trigger when a command completes. From a read perspective, this means it will trigger when the read data is ready. From a write perspective, this will trigger when write persistence has been met or the write has been pushed to non-volatile media. And currently, these response events are triggered based off of static delays defined within the interface, um, but that could be easily expanded to support non-determinism. From a data bus perspective, the data bus is deterministically accessed, and that is done um, to enable multiple technologies to share the bus. So that is something that we want to maintain moving forward, even if we do add non-determinism to the command response. And I'll get into more details as we go over the next few slides, looking at a read and write, um, the, read, the changes for read and writes for the NVM interface. The NVM interface defines a two-stage read operation. The first stage being the read request, in which the command remains in queue, no data is transmitted, and the second stage being the actual data burst. For the first stage, the NVM interface will use the choose read function. In this function, the read queue is scanned. The first read that it finds that has not issued will be issued. An event is scheduled for when that read will complete. That event, the read ready event, is scheduled based off of static delays defined in the NVM interface, specifically based off of T-read, and the page status is also used to ensure that we optimize requests that go to parallel resources within the media. Now this delay is static, but future work could expand on this to add non-determinism. When the read ready event triggers, when the read completes, the NVM interface will request a controller event to schedule the data burst. Within the controller, that event, uh, once triggered, will cause the controller to scan the queue 
and determine what read should issue next. Um, it will scan the queue and issue uh, the data, data burst based off of its scheduling algorithm. So there's no guarantee that it will select the NVM burst, but that NVM burst is queued and ready and can issue immediately. From the right side, we've added the concept of write buffering closer to the non-volatile memory. And this is done to mitigate less performant media and also model what we're seeing within industry. Essentially offload write commands and data from the controller. And to do this, we've added a write response queue within the model. The depth of that queue is defined by the NVM interface. And when a write is issued, we will push into the write response queue. When the write completes, we will pop from the write response queue. The completion itself is based off of a static delay that again is defined in the NVM interface. This delay is defined as TWrite. And again, similar to the read, we also use the page status to ensure that we optimize accesses to parallel resources. Um, the delay is static, but future work could model non-determinism. And the queue itself is used to ensure that we do not uh, overflow the number of writes that could be handled by the non-volatile memory interface. So once that queue is full, future writes will be blocked until an entry opens up. Now that we've defined the read and write operations and we have the fundamentals of an initial NVM interface, we need to hook that up to the memory controller. Since we factored that out, it's fairly easy and this looks very similar to what we had before with the DRAM interface. We have a memory controller that now has an NVM parameter assigned to it that points to the NVM interface. The interface itself is an agnostic interface, so unlike the DRAM interface, which defined activates, precharges, refreshes, and very media-specific operations, the NVM interface is more agnostic with generic read and write operations. The um, Python object includes parameters that define basic timing, so we have our tread and tWrite, which we discussed earlier, tSend, which is the delay similar to CAS latency that it takes to transmit a burst, T burst, which is the burst length, as well as um, bus turnaround and rank to rank delays. Now that we've defined both an NVM and a DRAM interface, we can take those interfaces and start creating different topologies. This is showing two uh, more definitely feasible, but here are some two basic topologies that we can hook up with current Python scripts. The first one shows a memory controller, or actually four memory controllers, and each memory controller connects both to NVM and DRAM. Now both the NVM interface and the DRAM interface are defined as abstract memories, so each one will have their own unique address range. Here we have four memory controllers, so we've interleaved across the four memory controllers, both for the DRAM and the NVM, using the interleaving masks defined for each memory technology. And the memory controller will be able to um, target each media based off of the address range that it receives. On the other side, we have a scenario in which case the, each memory controller interfaces to a single media type. So we have uh, DRAM connected to two memory controllers and NVM connected to two memory controllers. Again, each interface defines its own address range just in this scenario, the memory controller is only interfacing to a single interface and thus a single address range. For next steps, there's a few items listed here on the slide looking at adding non-determinism to read and write delays, evaluating some of the low power modes and adding support for that within GEM5 for non-volatile memory, and of course looking at additional topologies. The main point or goal of these changes, though, was to create an infrastructure where we could start adding new interfaces easily into the memory controller and start using those to evaluate future memories and continue to evaluate emerging non-volatile memory. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you at the Gem5 workshop.